the previous ones probably were security engineers, world-class security engineers disguised as a CISO. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's edition of Life of a CISO with yours truly, Dr. Eric Cole. And it's always a pleasure to spend some time with you to talk about my favorite topic of how can you, not anyone else, but you become a world-class chief information security officer. Some of you I might know, some of you I might not know, but I can tell you one thing. I care about each one of you. I care about your success and I want all of your dreams to come true. That's why I spend time every single week for free. Right? I don't get paid for this. This is fun for me because I love to help people. I'm on a mission to make cyberspace a safe place to live, work, and raise a family. And there's a fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is we don't have enough translators. We do not have enough people that understand how to apply cybersecurity to business and speak to people in English. I, I see all the time where when there's breaches or attacks on the news and they have these cybersecurity experts and they sound impressive, right? They might have, uh, you know, I mean, wearing crazy caps and have dragon banners in the background and right, all that stuff, which I'm like, what? Uh, and, and they're using a lot of big terms that sound super impressive, but nobody understands what they're saying. Being a world-class security engineer, being brilliant, being a genius when it comes to cybersecurity is not what the world needs. We have those folks, right? We have them, they're out there. The problem is nobody's listening to them because nobody understands what they're saying, right? I know if you go in and you read a lot of these different articles and op-eds and things from colleges, they go in and say that we do not have enough cybersecurity professionals and it's one of the biggest gaps out there and it's one of the best career paths for people going into college and getting out of college. Now, yes, completely agree with that. Right? If you know somebody or somebody in your family or a relative likes technology, likes solving problems, likes to be creative, likes to always work on new challenges, likes to think out of the box, then absolutely. Cybersecurity is one of the best career fields out there. You can make a lot of money, you can have a lot of fun, and you can make a huge difference in the world. So I'm not taking away that we need more technical people. We need more people graduating from colleges and working in the cybersecurity field. Completely agree with that. However, that's not the biggest problem. That's not the reason why the United States and other countries are getting hit with massive ransomware extortion attacks. It's not the reason why companies are getting broken into. I will tell you almost every one of the major breaches that happened. When we go in and we worked probably about 65% of them, we're one of the go-to companies, not necessarily in the incident response, but on the recovery. How do you fix and get operational as quick as possible? That's where our specialty is. And building out proactive roadmaps so you don't get hit and you don't get broken into. And when we go in after there's a breach and we determine what happened and we sit down with the world-class technical folks and security engineers, they're usually not surprised. It's not like they're, we had no idea. It was, nobody listens to us. We've tried to talk to our executive team. They don't understand security. They ignore us. We don't get invited to the meetings. Right? One of my favorite, favorite questions when I go in and I start working with a company and working with their security team. When was the last time 
you actually sat down with the executive team and talked about cybersecurity. And then my second question is, what's the frequency in which you sit down and talk with the executives? And usually the answer is very common, a never, or I think it may be 17, 18 months ago, or, or maybe, yeah, once every few years, or when there's a major breach, or when there's an issue, or this or that, but it's not at the frequency level that's needed. Legal meets with the executives on a regular basis. Finance meets with the executives on a regular basis. Sales and marketing meets with the executives on a regular basis. IT typically meets with the executives usually quarterly or monthly. Security very rarely meets with the executives. And the reason is simple. The executives don't get value out of it. Let's just be honest here, right? If you know me when I say with love in my heart, that means I might be a little bit, right? I'm not trying to get anyone upset. I'm here to help you. I care about you. That's why I take time out of my day to put together this Life of a CISO podcast. But the reality is, who do you spend time with? You spend time with people that you like, people that you understand, the people that you get along with. If there's somebody who, whenever you speak to them, you don't understand what they're saying, they potentially inadvertently, and maybe not on purpose, make you feel stupid, and you always walk away from the conversation like, what just happened and what just occurred over the last 45 minutes, are you going to want to meet with that person? Are you going to want to spend more time with them? No. They're going to be the person the next time they text you, oh, I'm real busy, or I'll get back to you when I have some free time. Right? You're going to push them off and not want to associate with them. On the flip side, who do you like spending time with? People that you can relate to. People that you can speak their language. People who you get along with. People who when you walk away from the conversation, you feel good and you feel like you got value out of it. That is true in every situation in life, no matter who you're dealing with. And it's very, very applicable to executives. Executives spend a lot of time with financial sales and marketing because they understand, they know what they're saying, and they walk away from the conversation with value. The reason why executives don't spend time with security is because they don't understand what they're saying. I, that's, to me, why the missing ingredient, the missing link, the most important thing in cybersecurity is world-class CISOs. That's why I'm on a mission to train, create world-class CISOs because with those in place, with a world-class CISO in an organization, the problem is solved. Because I've seen this time and time again. I talk to security and they go, yeah, we never talk to the execs. They don't listen to us. Nobody values our opinion. I train up and put in place a world-class CISO that can translate, that can understand business, understand cybersecurity, and bridge the gap. And they're now meeting with the executives on a weekly basis. They're now invited to all the meetings. They get invited to the ad hoc lunches when people just walk around and say, hey, I'm going to go grab a sandwich. Anyone want to come along? They're part of that group because the CEO the COO and the board of directors can understand, relate, and enjoy talking to them. They're speaking business. They're giving them information that helps and enables the business. So if we have to go in and look at the fundamental problem that we're having right now in cybersecurity, it's we don't have enough world-class CISOs that understand and can speak business and translate between business and cybersecurity. Just want to take a quick break. I hope you're enjoying the show. I have this free webinar that I would love for you to check out if you want to become a world-class CISO. So what you need to do if you're currently a CISO 
or you want to become a CISO is you need to evaluate what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses. If you're currently a CISO, how often do you meet with your executive team? If it is quarterly or greater, if it's quarterly once a year, twice a year, or, oh, whenever there's a problem or an issue, otherwise you could go six or nine months without talking with your executives. With love in my heart, and I care about you, I want you to be successful. You are a world-class security engineer. You are not a world-class CISO. And I know some people might get mad at me. Some people might get upset with me. It won't be the first, it won't be the last. But unfortunately, we have to recognize the hard truth, which is that's reality. It is the truth. So you need to go in and work on how you can go in and speak the language of business, how you can start going in and talking about how cybersecurity can enable the business to be successful. And the good news is, it's not hard. I solved the problem for you. Right? In life, if you want to achieve a certain goal, there's two ways to do it. One is, you can go out on your own and figure it out, and you're gonna get a lot of cuts and bruises, you're gonna get a lot of battle scars, and it's gonna take you a while to get there. Or you can learn from somebody who's done it and let them make all the mistakes so you don't have to. Right? I became a CISO in the mid-90s where there wasn't a CISO. Right? I joke, I was a CISO before the title existed. And so I had to learn the hard lessons. So you can learn from me or you can make those mistakes yourself. But what it really comes down to is all executives really care about is wanting to know in business language what could happen to the business, what is the likelihood of it occurring, what is the cost if it occurs, and what is the cost to fix it. When I go in and do executive briefings, the briefing part, now the Q&A can sometimes go on for a while because security is a big concern and a hot topic, but the briefing itself is 10 to 15 minutes, and depending on the frequency in which I'm presenting, is anywhere between one to three slides. <clears throat> if this is the first time, I will go in and talk about the threats to the industry. I will talk about some of the critical data and unique challenges to the organization, slide two. And my third one will be, here's where we need to focus. Here is 12 critical risks, the risk, likelihood of occurring, cost if it occurs and cost to fix it. And I think we should go in and fix the top four. And that's basically the briefing. Now, if it's reoccurring on a weekly, monthly basis, I'll only do that one chart. If you're going in with more than 10 slides and it's taking you more than 20 minutes to do the presentation, you're doing it wrong, right? That's not, the executives don't care about all the technical security components. They don't care about the increase or decrease in false positives and false negatives. They don't go in and care about all those components. That's world-class security engineers. You need to just present the impact to the business and how you can allow cybersecurity to be a business enabler. And I know for folks who have worked as world-class security engineers for eight, 10, 12, 15 years, they struggle like, no, Eric, they, I need to present this. No, you don't. If you were presenting to yourself a world-class security engineer, you would need to present it. But you are not presenting to yourself. That's one of the biggest, biggest mistakes we see is we use the phrase treat people the way we want to be treated. We present to people the way that we want to be presented to. Well, that works with one assumption, if the person you're speaking to is exactly like you, right? If they're identical to you. So if you're speaking to other world-class security engineers and you're a world-class security engineer, that works. But where it doesn't work is if the person you're speaking to is not a world-class security engineer. 
And that's when you need to use the new phrase. Treat people the way they want to be treated. So how does a CEO, a COO, and a CFO think? What do they want to know? What are the things that are important to them? They know that you have a world-class team. They don't need to know technology. They do not want to become a security professional. That is not in their career path. They could care less about that. So trying to teach them or train them on security isn't going to work. You need to go in and speak the language of business that they want. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is I'm seeing this problem getting worse. Almost every week for the last couple of months, sometimes two or three times a week, I see articles. CISO at Company X left after six months. CISO at Company Y left after four months. CISO at Company Z left after nine months. And there's a simple reason. It's because they are being a world-class security engineer and they're not being a world-class CISO. The good news, bad news, depending on how you look at it, is executives' tolerance for a CISO that doesn't speak their language and add value to the business, their tolerance level has decreased significantly. Before the pandemic, before all those issues, 2018, 2019, early 2020, it would typically take companies 18 to 24 months before their frustration level rose when they had a world-class security engineer disguised as a CISO. World-class security engineers, unless they make a conscious change, it can happen, it's hard, but it can happen to become a world-class CISO. But if you're a world-class security engineer disguised as a CISO, it would usually take companies about 18, 24 months before they got frustrated, fed up, and basically said, adios. Or the CISO got so frustrated that they said, adios. But now, since the pandemic and since the ransomware attacks earlier this year and the increase and focus on cybersecurity and the concern vector, the tolerance level of executives are much lower. If in six, seven months, you're not adding value, they're going to get rid of you. Or they're going to make your life so miserable that you're going to leave. Right? They're really following that rule of, Hire slow, fire fast, right? We're seeing that. It used to be with CISOs because they were so desperate to have somebody in the position, it would be hire fast, fire slow. And they realized that didn't work. So now they're taking longer before they hire that person. Instead of hiring somebody in 30 days, I'm seeing 90 to 120. So if you want to become a world-class CISO, you need to recognize it has nothing to do with you. Even if you're the best candidate, they're typically going to take 60 to 90 days to make sure. Because at most companies, you're not their first CISO. You're probably third, fourth, or fifth CISO. And the previous ones probably were security engineers, world-class security engineers disguised as a CISO. So they're super concerned to make sure you're not right, that wolf in sheep's clothing. Right? They're going to make sure this is the real deal. This is somebody who can handle it. So during the interviews, during the first 90 days when you're hired, it's all about business. It's all about building up and showing that you're a business thought leader. You just happen to be focused on cybersecurity, but you're a business leader. Now, here's the issue. Many people that are becoming CISOs or are currently CISOs, if you look at their career, it's seven, eight years of being a world-class security engineer 
and two or three years or less. Some even might be zero if it's your first job. Less of being a CISO. So when you get nervous, when you get pressured, when you get put in the corner, what happens? Your true personality comes out, right? Who you really are comes out. So with that, when you get pressured or you're nervous for an interview, you're gonna fall back to the eight years of world-class security engineer and not on the business, and that's the mistake. You gotta get so comfortable that even if you're nervous, even if you're pressured, it's all about the business. When you're interviewing with the CEO, COO, CFO, they wanna know, do you think business, eat business, sleep business? Now, of course, you wanna tie security into that, but you wanna always go in and speak about how you're going to help the business and the best hint I can give you. Cybersecurity, when done correctly, is a business enabler. How can you show that cybersecurity is a business enabler? So two situations. One is you're in the interview or you're on the job and you get hit with ransomware. Your company gets hit with ransomware. You're a brand new CISO. You're two months on the position. You're eager and ready to go. Your company gets hit with ransomware. What do you do? What do you do? If your response would be to go and figure out what happened, to run in and see what code got impacted, what is the ransomware, where is it coming from, go to the logs, look at the details, try to figure out what occurred, you're still behaving like a world-class security engineer. That's what a world-class security engineer would do. A world-class CISO would go in and task their team to say, find out what happened, find out the details, go to the logs, I'm gonna go talk to the executives. And you're gonna go to the CEO, CEO, or CFO and say, okay, it looks like we got hit with ransomware. They're currently asking for X amount ransom. Within 45 minutes, I will have a damage assessment of how much data, how much damage, and what options are available. I believe that we could probably go in and recover from backups, but I wanna make sure that we have all of the details and options. So I will have multiple scenarios available to you within 45 minutes. And then you go back and you tell your team exactly what you need and you start putting together those options. You then plug in the data. Then within 45 minutes, you go back and say, okay, we have three options. Option one is we pay the ransom. I already talked to the insurance company. They will go in and cover the ransom payment. We did research who this ransomware entity is, and they typically do recover the data. They too typically give it back if you do pay, and that will allow us to be up and operational within 12 hours. Option two is we can go in and we can recover from backup. We do have our tapes available. That's going to go in and take approximately 20 hours, so it'll take eight more hours, but then we won't have to pay the ransom and we'll be able to increase the infrastructure. The third option is we can go in and migrate our data stores to a cloud-based environment and operate via the cloud. That's gonna limit functionality because we can't get everything up and running, but that will allow us to be operational within 10 hours and fully operational within 72 hours. Which option would you like? And then if they ask you, you do have a recommendation of which option you prefer, but that's world-class CISO. World-class CISO is you focused on the business, the recovery of the business and the options, and you let your technical team do what they need to do from a technical standpoint. So that's a nice little scenario to play out in your head when you, if you're currently a CISO or you wanna be a CISO, is what would you do if you got hit with ransomware? How would you respond? How would you react? 
And I know I always laugh because when I go in and I ask that question of some people, some of the smart ones go, oh, Eric, we wouldn't get hit with ransomware. I would have our company so good and so locked down that we would never, ever get hit with ransomware. And I smile and go, you're a world-class security engineer because that's how a security engineer thinks, right? World-class security engineers are going to protect the company. They're going to believe that they're not gonna get hit with ransomware. They're gonna believe that they're indestructible. However, world-class CISOs know that's not the reality. They know that you need to enable the business. They know that you need to take risks. They know that no matter what you do and what you put in place, that there is always a potential of getting hit with ransomware. And they're gonna have a plan to both prevent and recover. They're gonna say, yes, we are gonna do things like backing up data, redundant, limit exposure. We're gonna try to reduce the probability, but we know to prevent 100% us getting hit with ransomware, it would cripple the functionality of the business to the point where it wouldn't be successful. And we can't allow that because that would make cybersecurity a disenabler to the business. And cybersecurity enables the business to be successful. And therefore, we have to allow the functionality and we have to allow the probability that we could get hit with ransomware, but we're going to have a plan. We're going to have a plan in place on how to be able to recover. So I want you to spend some time, whether you're currently a CISO or you want to be a CISO, is are you thinking correctly? Are you focusing on making cybersecurity a business enabler? And are you so strong that even when you get nervous, even when pressure comes down on you, you're gonna default to being a world-class CISO and you're not going to default to being a world-class security engineer. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Life of a CISO. We are getting so much positive feedback. We're starting now to get people completing our CISO certification and they are doing amazing things. They are going in and getting CISO jobs at Fortune 100 companies. They're doubling their income. They're starting these CISO businesses. They're doing amazing things. So if it's been more than four months where you're like, well, I think I wanna be a CISO and you've done nothing, you need to sign up for this program. You need to go in and in six months be where you need to be. Because I guarantee in six months with my 40 hours of knowledge transfer, my six months of coaching with me, live coaching with me and the private peer group, you'll be where you wanna be. So the question is quite simple. Do you wanna be in the same exact spot in six months, still wondering and thinking about being a CISO? Or do you want your life to change? If you sign up for this program in six months, your life will be completely different than the way it is right now. So you can either go to that link, see some more details, sign up for a consultation call, or you can send me an email at ecole at secure-anchor.com and I'd love to give you details and set you up with one of my consultants to get you in this program because like I said, it's proven. I know it works. I know I can help you and I care about you and I want you to fulfill all your dreams. Once again, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.